today I am going to read part 3 of The Monkey's Paw. In the huge new cemetery some two miles distant, the old people buried their dead and came back to the house steps, steeped in shadow and silence. It was all over so quickly that at first they could hardly realize it and remained in a state of ex expectation as though something else as though of something else to happen, something else which was to lighten this load too heavy for old hearts to bear. But the days passed and expectation gave place to res res resignation, the hopeless resignation of the old, sometimes miscalled apathy. Sometimes they hardly exchanged the word, for now they had nothing to talk about, and their lives were long, were long to weariness. It was about a week after the old man walked the waking old, after the old man, waking suddenly in the night, stretched out his hand and found himself alone. The room was in the darkness, and the sound of the subdued weeping came from the window. He raised himself in bed and listened. Come back, said Tenderly. You will be cold. It is colder for my son, said the old woman, and wept afresh. The sound of her sobs died away on his ears. The bed was warm, and his eyes heavy with sleep. He dozed fitfully and then slept until some wild cry from his wife awoke him with a start. The paw, she cried wildly. The monkey's paw. He started up in alarm. Where? Where is it? What's the matter? She came, stumbling across the room towards him. I want it, she said quickly. You've not destroyed it. It's in the parlor on the bra bracket, he replied He replied. Marveling, why? She cried and laughed together, and bending over kissed his cheek. I only just thought of it, she said hysterically. Why well, didn't I think of it before? Why didn't you think of it? Think of what? He questioned. The other two wishes, she replied roughly. We've only had one. <laughs> Was that not enough? He demanded fiercely. No, she cried triumphantly. We'll have one more. Go down and get it quickly and wish our boy alive again. The man sat up in bed and flung the bedclothes from his quaking limb. Good God, are you mad? He cried, aghast. Get it, she panted. Get it quickly and wish. Oh, my boy, my boy. Her husband struck a match and lit the candle. Candle. Get back to bed, he said unsteadily. You don't know what you're saying. We had the first wish granted, said the old woman feverishly. Why not the second? And so this is a picture of the woman going through the door. Um, so we can figure out. A coincidence, stared with the old man. Go and get it, a wish, cried his wife. Quivering with excitement, the old man turned and regarded her, and his voice shook. He had been dead ten days, and besides he, and besides he, I would not tell you else, but I could only recognize him by his clothes. If he was too terrible for you to see now, how then? Bring him back? Bring him back, cried the old woman and dragged him towards the door. Do you think I fear the child I have nursed? He went down into darkness and fell his way to the parlor, and then to the mantelpiece. The talisman was in its place, and a horrible fear that the unspoken wish might bring his um, multitude son before him ere he could escape from the room seized upon him, and he caught his breath until, as he found that he, lo he had lost the direction of the door. 
His brow cold with sweat. He felt his way around the table and groped along the wall until he found himself in a small passage with the unwholesome thing in his hand. Even his wife's face seemed changed as he entered the room. It was white and expectant, and to his fears seemed to have an unnatural look upon it. He was afraid of her. Wish, she cried in a strong voice. It is foolish and wicked, he faltered. Wish, repeated his wife. He raised his hand. I wish my son alive again. The talisman fell to the floor, and he regarded it fearfully. Then he sank trembling into a chair as the old woman, with burning eyes, walked to the window and raised the blind. He sat until he was chill with cold, glancing occasionally at the figure of the old woman peering through the window. The end, the candle end, which had burned below the rim of the china candlestick, was throwing pulsating shadows on the ceiling and walls until, with a, fl- with a flicker larger than the rest, it expired. The old man came with an unspeakable sense of relief as the failure of the talisman crept back into his bed. In a minute or two afterwards, the old woman came silently and apathetically behind him. Neither spoke, but lay silently listening to the ticking of the clock. A sail creaked, and a squeaky mouse scurried noisily through the wall. The darkness was oppressive, and after lying for some time, screwing up his courage, took the box of can- matches and striking one, went downstairs for a candle. At the foot of the stairs, the match went out, and he paused to strike another, and at the same moment, a knock, so quiet and stealthy as to be scarcely audible, sounded at the front door. The matches fell from his hand and spilled in the passage. He stood motionless, his breath suspended until the knock was repeated. Then he turned and fled swiftly back to his room and closed the door behind him. A third knock sounded through the house. What's that? cried the old woman, darting up. A rat, said the old man in shaking tones. A rat. It passed me by on the stairs. The wife sat up in bed, listening. A loud knock was resounded through the house. It's Herbert, she screamed. It's Herbert. She ran to the door, but her husband was before her, and catching her by the arm, held her tightly. What are you going to do? he whispered hoarsely. It's my boy, it's Herbert, she cried, struggling me- me- mechanically. I forgot it was two miles away. What are you holding me for? Let let go, I must open the door. For God's sake, don't let it in, Said the old, cried the old man, trembling. I'm afraid of your own, you're afraid of your own son, she cried, struggling. Let me go. I'm coming, Herbert. I'm coming. There was another knock and another. The old woman with a sudden wrench broke free and ran from the room. Her husband followed to the landing and called after her, appealing her appealingly as she hurried downstairs. He heard the chain rattle back and forth, back in the bottom bolt drawn slowly and stiffly from the socket. Then the woman's voice, and then the one old woman's voice, strained and panting. The bolt, she cried lo- loudly. Come down, I can't reach it. But her husband was on his hands and knees, groping wildly on the floor, on the floor in search of the paw. If he could only find it before the thing got out, got outside, got in. Perfect fluctuation of knocks. Re- re- reverberated through the house and he heard the scrapings of a chair as his wife put it down down in the passage against the door. He heard the creaking of the bolt as it came slowly back and at the same moment he found the monkey paw and frantically breathed 
his third and last wish. The knocking ceased suddenly, although echoes of it were still in the house. He heard the chair drawn back and the door opened. A cold rush wind rushed up the stairway and a long, loud wail of disappointment and misery from his wife gave him courage to run down to his side and then to the gate beyond. The street lamp flickered off opposite, shone on a quiet and desert, deserted road. And here's the monkey's paw. And that is the end of the story. And that's it. Yeah, and then have a great day. Bye.